Okay, so we're going to attempt to do a video here using the smart board uh, to talk about the nucleophilic substitution reactions. I'll try to talk loud, and we'll see ah, how it goes if I don't drop all the markers. Okay, so first of all, we know what a nucleophile is. We know that it basically means something that uh, likes the nucleus. So it's got to be something that has uh, a non-bonding electron pair. Okay. Um, and so it's going to donate that electron pair. We're going to show that with the curly arrows, um, the double-headed curly arrow. Um, the nucleophile that you need to know really is the hydroxide ion. Um, you'll eventually have to compare it to water as a nucleophile. Uh, but these both work well as nucleophiles because oxygen has these lone pairs, these non-bonding pairs of electrons. Um, but again, hydroxide is going to be the main nucleophile to know. The overall chemical equation for the nucleophilic substitution reaction is going to be uh, hydroxide reacts with some sort of halogenoalkane, so some sort of Rx. That's going to be my generic symbol for halogenoalkane, where R represents some sort of CH and X represents a halogen. And in the process, it's just a substitution reaction. So remember to use those helpful names to remind you what's going to take place in this reaction. The hydroxide is going to take the place of the halogen. And so we're going to end up with ROH and X minus. So X minus could be chloride, the ion, or bromide ion. Um, but what we formed is an alcohol. And we could call this a halide ion. Okay. Now, sometimes they're going to write this, instead of just hydroxide, the ion, they'll write like NaOH, sodium hydroxide, in which case the final product would be uh, sodium bromide or sodium chloride solution. But usually you can remove the sodium since it's a spectator ion and just look at the net ionic equation that I've written in green. Okay, so one of the trickiest things about nucleophilic substitution is that there's actually two mechanisms. Uh, they are referred to as SN1 and SN2, uh, respectively. And so let's break down those terms. The S just equals substitution. And the N, the little N, just equals nucleophilic. So that's not really anything scary because that's what their reaction mechanism is called. The 1 refers to unimolecular. And the two refers to bimolecular. If those terms sound familiar, it's because we talked about them during the kinetics unit. We were talking about uh, rate mechanisms and breaking rates down into individual steps. And we said some steps only involved one particle, one reactant particle, and those steps were called unimolecular steps. And some steps involved two particles, and those steps were called bimolecular steps. So the reason why these two mechanisms are called SN1 and SN2 is because the rate determining step of each mechanism involves a different number of particles. And so the end result is that the rate equation for the SN1 mechanism uh, shows that the rate only depends on the halogenoalkanes concentration. So again, this is a reaction between hydroxide and a halogenoalkane. Um, and so, but in the SN1, the hydroxide concentration does not matter because it's not involved in the rate determining step. So what you end up with is you're gonna end up with two steps in the SN1. The first one is the slow rate determining step and the second one is the fast step. And so the hydroxide ends up being involved in the second fast step, which is why it doesn't show up in the rate equation. For SN2, it involves uh, both things in the rate equation. Both concentrations matter. It's a one-step mechanism, and both the halogenoalkane and the hydroxide ion are in that first step. Okay, So you've got bimolecular, and you've got, in this case, a unimolecular first step, and that's why they're called SN1 and SN2. I'm going to start with the SN2 mechanism. I think normally it's a little bit more intuitive, but you'll have to know both mechanisms. Okay. So it's a one-step reaction. However, confusingly, it's sort of going to get drawn in two steps. Um, 
we are going to show uh, going from its starting point up to what we call a transition state, which is sort of what you can think of existing at the top of the activation energy hill. And then we're going to show it coming down to being a product. So we're going to show both this arrow and then we're going to show this arrow. Okay, so we're going to show two different things taking place, even though in terms of uh, you know reaction kinetics, we would say that this reaction takes place in one big step. <clears throat> okay, so the first thing to show, if we use one bromobutane and hydroxide, uh, in the first part, here's your hydroxide ion, and usually when you draw a mechanism, you draw out the structural formulas. So here's bute, and I'm going to put bromo on number one. I think it's easiest if I put it down here, and the rest are hydrogens. Okay, so the curly arrow always shows you where the electrons are moving. Well, the electrons are here on the hydroxide. You don't need to draw them in, but it can be a helpful reminder. Uh, so you're going to draw the arrow starting on the oxygen. If you draw it starting on the hydrogen atom, you will lose a mark because they don't think you know where the electron pair is. Okay? Now, if you think about this bromobutane, what is this negative ion attracted to? Well, it's attracted to this carbon because this bond is polar. That's a little bit negative and that's a little bit positive. And so that polarity means that the nucleophile is attracted to that slightly positive uh, carbon atom. Okay. So this is the curly arrow uh, that we're going to draw. Now, the second curly arrow, okay, and it's called SN2, so that means both particles are involved in this step. We're going to draw two curly arrows in the same step. So the first one goes from the nucleophile to the carbon, and the second goes from the bond to the bromine atom. Okay? As the nucleophile starts to attach, the bromine atom starts to get kicked off. Okay? So that's the first thing you would draw in the mechanism, the nucleophile attacking and the halogen starting to leave. And then what you're going to draw here is that thing I called the transition state. Okay? So what it is is sort of you're drawing the halfway point of the reaction. So you're drawing that the hydroxide ion is sort of halfway attached, and you're drawing that the bromine atom is sort of halfway gone. Okay? Now you've also got to draw everything else that's attached here. So Think about what else is on the molecule. You've got a hydrogen sticking off that carbon, this hydrogen sticking off that carbon, and you've got this uh, sort of propyl group sticking off the carbon. So H, H, and you can either draw it all out the way it's been drawn there, or you can summarize it as C3, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, H7. So one way to simplify it would be C3, H7. The last thing to draw with this transition state is a negative charge. Notice that on the left, we had uh, a negatively charged hydroxide and we have a neutral halogenoalkane. So when they combine, they're going to have a negative charge. Okay. So that's the transition state. That's what's happening at the top of the activation energy hill. And then after that, if you could draw this all you know, left to right in one single step, that would be the best um, because it's just considered one overall step. The bromine is going to kick off, and we're going to be left with the carbon, now with this OH attached. Uh, we still, it's still bromo. We haven't uh, changed the number of carbon atoms. All we've done overall is substituted the OH for the BR. And so now the BR has fully kicked off, and it has a minus charge. So the mechanism for SN2 is considered to be an overall one-step reaction. Uh, it's SN2 because both of the molecules are involved in the first step. Uh, the two curly arrows are from the hydroxide ion to the carbon and from this bond to the bromine. The transition state has to show them both being partially attached and it has to have a negative charge. And then to end, you just make the alcohol and the halide ion. Okay. Okay, by comparison, here is the SN1 mechanism. Okay? Notice I've used a different kind of halogenoalkane. Oh, and this should say propane. I'll try to fix that. Uh, propane. Um, 
So it's still the same uh, isomer. It's still got four carbons total, but this halogenoalkane looks like this instead. It's got a methyl group off the two and it has the bromo group off the two. Okay, so same chemical formula, different structural formula. All right, now the issue here is that because of all these groups, because this is now a tertiary, halogenoalkane, and in the previous example, it was primary. The fact that it is tertiary means that all these methyl groups present a lot of electron cloud. They present a lot of electron sort of density. And in organic chemistry, that's going to create something called steric hindrance. It means that if our OH group tries to go after this carbon, it's going to be really hard for it to to come in from this backside to go after this carbon because there's all these methyl groups in the way. So as a result, when you have tertiary halogenoalkanes, the, the SN2 mechanism isn't really possible and it's not gonna happen because there's all those methyl groups in the way. So what happens instead, and this is backed up by, by rate data, um, again, the idea that this is the first step doesn't involve the hydroxide ion, is that in the first step, all that happens is this bond actually breaks on its own. Obviously in the presence of the other reactants, but there's evidence that this is what happens first. So the, the bromine kicks off and becomes a bromide ion. Uh, the hydroxide is not involved in this step. Remember, this is your slow rate determining step. And if you think about it, if you kick off a bromide ion, you end up with uh, a intermediate that looks like this. I'm just looking at here are the other three things attached to the carbon. There's a methyl group, a methyl group, and a methyl group. Okay. I put this in brackets because overall it has a charge. Before it was neutral. Now both of these electrons have left with the bromide. That's called heterolytic fission, where both electrons go to one of the atoms giving it a minus charge, and so therefore this must have a positive charge. So this thing that we formed in the middle is called a carbocation intermediate. It's an intermediate, not a transition state. It's considered, this is considered to be an actual reaction step, and these things are formed for a short time uh, in the first step of the reaction. It's called a carbocation because you've got a positively charged cation, and uh, at its base, it's that uh, positive charge is around the carbon atom. So the first step of an SN1 mechanism just involves one arrow from the bond to the halogen. And you end up forming a positively charged intermediate and a bromide ion. So then you have a second step that's considered to be quite fast. And the second step is that you take that positively charged carbocation, and now it's very easy for the hydroxide ion to attack it because now um, since it's got three things bonded to it, it's trigonal planar. That means there's uh, lots of openings from either side to attack this, uh, this carbon atom, and so that's where the new bond forms. And so this step is considered to be quite fast, and when you're done, you end up with your OH on your carbon, and now you've got your alcohol. So you start with a tertiary halogenoalkane, you end up with a tertiary alcohol. Um, you also make the halide ion, but you make it in the first step up here, in the slow step, and then in the second step, you form the alcohol, okay? Okay, so determining and differentiating SN1 versus SN2. Um, so a lot of the times, you're just gonna be told which mechanism to do, um, because uh, there are certain halogenoalkanes that can do either. If you have a secondary halogenoalkane, meaning you've got something like this where the halogen is sort of along the middle of the chain, this can do both uh, SN1 or SN2. And so in that type of reaction setup, you'd have to be told which mechanism to carry out. It's often, they often use that because then they could tell you to do both or tell you to do whichever one they want. 
Um, if you're not given a secondary one, you would be expected to know that a tertiary halogenoalkane will always do SN1 and a primary halogenoalkane will always do SN2. The reasoning again, <clears throat> the tertiary has that steric hindrance, which prevents the SN2 mechanism from happening, that sort of backside uh, attack. Uh, the other reason you could argue is that there's all those extra carbon atoms that are next to the halogen, um, when you have a tertiary halogenoalkane, have a positive inductive effect. The same thing we talked about in the addition reactions. Um, if I flip back really fast, these uh, methyl groups here are able to sort of contribute some stabilizing uh, negative charge electron cloud to this carbon atom where the positive charge is centered. And so it makes the carbocation more stable. Um, in this primary, there's uh, minimal positive inductive effects from that one carbon atom. Okay, so uh, you'd be expected to know that primary halogenoalkanes always do SN2, the tertiary ones uh, always do SN1, and that secondary can do either, and so you have to be told which one they're going to do. Okay. Some other ways in your mind to try to distinguish these things, how are they different? I try to remember that SN2 means two arrows in the same step, versus SN1 means one arrow per step. Okay? I recognize it's very confusing that SN1 actually takes place in two distinct steps with a slow and a fast, and uh, SN2 is considered just to take place in one step. Um, that is very confusing. Um, so try to hang on to what is two about it. The thing that's two about it are the two arrows in the one step. The thing that's one about it is one arrow per step. Um, other things you've got to remember, they both have something that looks like this in them. So this carbon with three uh, full bonds sticking off of it. But for SN1, that's all that there is. And in SN2, it's got the two dotted things sticking off it as well. It has the halogen and the hydroxide uh, sort of attaching and unattaching as the transition state. This is called a transition state, and this is called an intermediate. So lots of details to compare. Okay. Lastly, in terms of how they compare for their reaction rate, well, uh, SN1 is a faster overall mechanism. And it's because the, the enthalpy change or the activation energy of, I probably, that was a little bit wrong, like this, and then like this. Um, this is the intermediate, and this is the activation energy. So here's the intermediate, and here's the activation energy of that first step. And SN2, this transition state that gets formed is considered to be very high, exa uh, that's exaggerated, but very high activation energy. So even though the intermediate isn't exactly stable either, the activation energy is significantly lower to get uh, SN1 going than it is to get SN2 going. And that means that the SN2 mechanism is slower than the SN1 mechanism. Okay? Uh, we're going to talk about some other factors that affect uh, the reaction rates uh, in class, but for now we'll pause it.